Well, hello, everyone. This is Dr. J, host of The Sexuality Space. Welcome. As everyone is gathering into the space, I'm my silent co-host and virtual assistant, and all around, I can do anything. Misha Elliott is hopping into the space to take care of business behind the scenes today. And our guest has arrived and we'll be pulling her up as a speaker. So for those of you listening to the replay, The Sexuality Space is live every Wednesday noon Eastern on Twitter. Here I've created a sex positive community where we talk about different sex topics, meet CEOs of sex companies, sex educators, researchers, and writers, and I want you to see me doing my work in the daylight as I integrate sexuality into everyday life. And greetings to everyone. As a reminder, uh, this is a recorded space which will live on Twitter timeline and is repurposed on my website, my FlowGen playlist, and on YouTube. And I see we have some regulars that have popped in. Please note that the space is equipped with its own chat feature, which is at the bottom right-hand corner. You can ask questions there as the space goes on, or you can DM Misha or me with questions. Last week, we had Sex Toys Then and Now with Tin Kim Lam, a romance writer extraordinaire and founder of Body Bookworms. And next week, we'll be talking with Anne Solaya about sexual empowerment. But today, I am so thrilled to be hosting a book launch party for Rachel Kramer Bussell and her latest book, How to Write Erotica. So, Rachel, welcome to the space today. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you for um, doing this launch party because I didn't get to do any, any other kinds of, you know, in-person launches or anything, but I'm really excited about this book because I feel like I've been working on it, you know, not actively working on it, but, uh, you know, working towards it for a very long time. Well, and I have some specific questions for you on that. And what I thought we'd do is spend the first part of the space, um, you and I talking with each other and then opening the space so people can ask you questions. And we'll be um, at an hour. Is that good for you? I would love to do that. Yeah, it's been funny because I've been talking to some people in different spaces and I, I keep being asked. People are like, can you kind of help me workshop my erotica story? And it's fun. Like, I think. I don't know. It's kind of like it's sometimes it can be hard to figure out your own, you know, I, I get stuck on plots, too. But then when someone asked me, you know, does this would this work as an erotica story? And I just, you know, maybe I have an idea that they didn't have. So feel free to ask about that, people. I love it. I love it. Well, I want to start at the beginning. And um, I know that you have been writing and doing work for 20 plus years and that you've edited over 70 books, but people may not know how you fell into all of this. So why don't you tell everybody how you became who you are in the writing world? Okay, well, I started writing erotica in 1999. Um, this isn't what I went to school for. I didn't set out to do this. I just, um, I was reading a lot of erotica. That's really where it started. I had been reading uh, the Best American Erotica series. I, I can't remember exactly what year that came out, but I was reading, I guess, the earlier ones in around 96 to 99 when I was in college. Oh, no, wait. I was in college 93 to 96, so I was reading it then. That's where I first discovered erotica, um, including the Virgin Territory uh, Virgin Territory and Virgin Territory 2 books edited by Shara Rednauer, which were published by Masquerade Books, which sadly is no longer around. But um, And then in 1999, I saw a call for submissions, also Shara Rednauer, for Starfucker. It was a book of celebrity erotica, and I thought, okay, I've never written erotica, I've never written fiction, but I'm going to try this. And I did, and my story, Monica and Me, about Monica Lewinsky, got published in Starfucker, and then it got picked up by a Cleus Press anthology, Best Lesbian Erotica, 2001, edited by Tristan Taramino. And that was just so exciting to me. And I thought, okay, well, that was fun. I'll try writing another erotica story. And I wrote one called Lap Dance Lust, also inspired, the Monica story was inspired by a fantasy I had, and the lap dance one was inspired by an actual lap dance I had. And so... I just started writing erotica stories that were largely either autobiographical or based on things I had thought about. And then I got asked to co-edit it 
co-edit an anthology called Up All Night um, with Stacey Bias that was true lesbian sex stories, which is fitting because Virgin Territory was true lesbian sex stories. That was in 2004 that came out. And so basically since 2004, I've been editing or co-editing my own anthologies. And now usually I'm the one brainstorming. Sometimes my publisher comes to me and says like, hey, we'd like an anthology on this. Or I say, what do you think about this? But I've edited anthologies on everything from spanking. That's I did five anthologies of spanking because I, I love that topic. Um, bondage, oral sex. I did one on cross-dressing. Uh, I've done various um, topics, orgasms um, and kink. And then I have since volume three, which you were in, um, Donna, I for Best Women's Erotic of the Year. I, I think that's when I started doing themes for that series, um, mostly to make my work easier as an editor, because you know, I can tell pretty quickly if something fits a theme or not, but also to give readers a little more guidance. Cause I think sometimes when the theme is too broad or there's no theme, writers are like, well, what do I do? Although that being said, the theme for best women's erotic of the year volume 10 is anything goes. So that really is no theme. <laughs> oh, but, um, and for that one, previous to this, the first nine, I said that I want only new authors because I wanted to give as many authors a chance to be published as possible, but I am opening up volume 10 to past best women's erotic of the year authors. Although I'm giving preference to newer authors just to try to publish more voices. Cause that's always what I'm trying to do is elevate people who were in the position that I was in back in 1999 with no writing credits. Like I think it can be such a boost to your confidence and, and ego maybe. And just, it's such a, such a big encouragement to, to get a story published and then find readers that you wouldn't have reached otherwise. So I always want to do that for many people. Well, yeah. That's perfect. And, and that's a great segue for the, the part I want to talk about now, because you and I met in the fall of 2015 in a lovely cupcake bakery in Savannah, yeah, Georgia. I remember that. I can't believe, I remember it very clearly, but it, I can't believe it was 2015 because I've been thinking about going back to Savannah, but, I didn't realize it was so long ago. I know, eight years. That's like, wow. And um, I was taking your class between the sheets, and I think all the points that you just made about confidence and feeling good about what you're doing and figuring things out. I mean, I've taken two years worth of novel writing classes now, and I've done all these different things and never thought that I would be where I am today. And it's because of you. Oh, thank you so much. And I was saying on LinkedIn that I, in my guidelines for Best Women's Erotica of the Year, I highlight your story from volume three, Infused Leather, because that to me is such a powerful story. It's both erotic and touches on like real life issues of trauma and, um, you know, overcoming them and, and using, in this case, this leather fetish and this kink to, to just to explore sexuality and to, to just improve your character's life. And I think that is a tricky thing to do to incorporate dark issues you know, that, that are not, that are not, that are, that are hard to hear about. Right. And that are, but that are realistic to a lot of people. And then to, to use them to tell an erotic story that's also still erotic. Cause sometimes people send me stories that are beautifully written and, you know, emotionally powerful, but then they're missing the erotic component. So it doesn't work for me as erotica. It might work for another editor of another kind of fiction, but like I need all the stories to also be erotic. So I, I think that's just, you did that so powerfully and. Oh. Your words are too kind. I absolutely love it. And, you know, I think I was thinking about going through the your book and it was like revisiting the class, um, you know, mm -hmm. going back through the book and different memories that I had about being in the class and how we put things together. And I have to tell you, I have several questions I want to ask. But first, why now? After 20 plus years, how did this book emerge? Um, That's a good question. I... Honestly, I feel like I was in a bit of a fog the like last, you know, three years of the pandemic. And I had COVID last May when I was wrapping up the book. Thankfully, I had 
I think I was like 90% of the way through when, when I got COVID. Um, but um, I, it, it had been on my mind for a long time. I don't remember exactly when I started teaching erotica writing classes, probably something like 2008. And I think I just thought, well, you know, I've been editing so many hundreds of stories for so long and I have this knowledge that I'd like to share with people selfishly partly so that they could write stories that I would want to publish um so I started teaching at I've taught at all kinds of venues colleges conferences sex toy stores and now mostly online um but I wanted to you know, create something, A, that was more accessible. Not everyone has the time to take a class and a class is only two or three hours or that older class I taught that you took uh, was longer, like multiple weeks. But even if I do a multi-week course again, you know, I think having a book you can hold in your hand, you can revisit, you can pick up at any time and do it at at your schedule is helpful to people. Uh, So I wanted to capture that. And then because I'm I'm a very community-minded person. I ran a reading series in New York, an erotic reading series for five years uh, that had over 300 speakers, readers. So I, I always want to include other voices. I never want to say, oh, I have the definitive answer to everything. So it was really important to me to talk to other erotica authors, erotic romance authors, a beta reader, a a sensitivity reader. So I have those interviews and quotes from those people in the book. And to me, I mean, I could have gone longer. I I had had a word count that I had to stick to, but I, I definitely wanted to offer other perspectives about things that I haven't experienced or don't know as much about because I don't think there's only one way to write erotica. I don't think there's only one way to have an erotic writing career. I don't think there's one way to publish. And I wanted to give an overview and people can decide for themselves. And sometimes people say to me, well, is it better to self-publish or go with a traditional publisher? Or is it better to do first person or third person or, you know, specialize or be a generalist? And like, I can't answer that for you. Every author has to decide that for themselves. I've mostly written short stories. Some people only write novels or novellas. Um, that's another choice. It, it really depends what your goal is, what you're trying to do, what what you're naturally um, good at. You know, I, I think there's just so many factors that go into it. And no, I don't think anyone can tell you what you should do. Even if you have a literary agent, you're still driving the conversation as a writer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, your goals will depend on all those things I said, also the time you have available. And, and I think to me, it comes down to like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to write to the market and, you know, kind of find readers who already exist and write to them and for them? Or are you trying to express things that are in your heart and on your mind that, which these are not mutually exclusive, but do you already have an right. idea yeah. of what you of the story you want to tell and you're looking for outlets for that story? Those those approaches in general are are slightly different, but there may be overlap. Well, I have to tell you, I mean, having the book in my hands, I get so excited. Again, it's all about being in that class with you. And I think you're right when you have a product that helps people. Let me go back to that page. Let me reread that and let me think about that. I have to tell you, I fell in love with chapter three, the writing prompt oh, I'm chapter. I'm so glad. You, you have done a spectacular job of being expansive and open and you give permission to writers for the idea of I can write about anything in erotica from food to non-bed to clothing (laughs) to job to sex toy to fantasy sports I mean the list is unbelievable and you're that's a chapter that I (laughs) when I had to they made me cut a little bit for space and there were so there were more examples like more published examples of erotica that I had to cut some of those examples but I was like I definitely don't want to cut any of the writing prompts those are a lot large part of what I do in my writing workshops and I think the difference is in the workshop you get to hear what other people are writing but I, 
I mean, to me, I've been doing a lot of those prompts in my classes since those very first classes in 2008. And I, they never get old because everyone has a different approach to them. And, and you might have a different approach to them, you know, each time you do them. I, I certainly do. And I go back to them when I'm stuck. So that means a lot to me that you like them. And I, I, I really, if, any, if people take away anything from the book or my general philosophy on erotica, I hope it's that anyone can write erotica. You don't need, a, um, you know, an MFA or any specific degree. You don't need any specific sexual experience. I think the biggest thing you need is just an imagination and, and creativity. But I think you, you really just have to be open to your own mind and your own creativity and not feel stifled by either what you think society thinks about sex or, or kind of that internalized shame a lot of people have or, or what you think, you know, readers want to hear because readers, I mean, yes, there are some readers who only want very specific niches within erotica. So if you write that great, but that doesn't mean that if you want to write about, I don't know what, I'm literally looking at a candle. I wish I could, I'll take a photo of it and post it after. I wish I could show you. It's a candle that I had brought to do a giveaway, but then I didn't want to send it because I didn't want it to melt. It's like a bondage candle, this sexy woman in, in bondage. And um, anyway, like, I don't know what, maybe that is a massage. This is not a massage candle, but maybe someone has like a massage candle in that shape, or maybe someone has a candle fetish. I mean, I don't, I've literally never thought about this before. So I don't know how you would write this specific fetish. But my point is that, you know, I'm just looking around my house at the things that I see lying around. And I, I could come up with 10 story ideas if I really, if I wanted to. Now, I, I'm also looking at Brussels sprouts. I don't personally, <laughs> I don't know if I want to write a story about Brussels sprouts. Like, I, I, I like Brussels sprouts to eat them. I, I'm not erotically attracted to them, but but you could. And, you know, if yeah. someone did, I think that would be unusual that would stand out because most people if they're doing the food writing prompt are I'm going to go out on a limb and say 99% of people are not writing about Brussels sprouts so if you can that can make your work stand out I don't necessarily think people are typing into Amazon you know Brussels sprout erotica but if you found a way to make it sexy like maybe there's some chef who specializes in vegetables and wants to convert people to vegetarianism and they know that chef dresses in a sexy way and you know I don't know maybe the restaurant has an erotic theme I, I don't know but like there's so many places you could go and I think what makes erotica so exciting is that everyone will will approach it slightly differently even if they're all writing about like even if my prompt was write about a veg vegetarian restaurant where the dress where the chef dresses in a sexy way and the tonight's special is Brussels sprouts, like 10 people are going to take that prompt and go in different, 10 different directions with it. And that's okay. Like no one is. Right that's the beauty. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I also see Misha Elliott has her hand up. First, thank you so much for being here. This is so I I'm fangirling. Oh, um, also, I'm thinking about this Brussels sprout <laughs> idea and I'm like, well, think about peeling the layers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're revealing the core. You are. I can't help <laughs> and it. Also, okay. I'm going to go. I, right think now. <laughs> food, I mean, you could substitute any food here for this. I, I think food is so sensual and intimate and maybe, maybe you're like, thinking that about, oh, I hate Brussels sprouts, but that's okay. Your character could hate Brussels sprouts, but maybe they fall for someone who is a Brussels sprout farmer. And I mean, we can take it beyond the restaurant and, you know, maybe they're like, okay, well, I'm in love with this Brussels sprout farmer. I'm going to give them a try. And then the Brussels sprout farmer is trying to seduce the person who hates them by making them sauteed and super special. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think, any food, any, any, anything from the prompts or your own mind, you can find a way to make that into erotica if you want to. That, that's not to say that I expect everyone to go through the book, you know, page by page. You can jump around or that you have to write about candles or Brussels sprouts or 
whatever, but that you could. And for me as a writer, especially after I'd been, you know, writing erotica for five years or so, I got kind of bored in my own mind with the stories that were starring characters that were like me and going this, the same places. And I, I said to myself, Rachel, you, you, you have to stop writing stories set at parties, not because there's anything wrong with parties, but I'd written, I don't know, like 10 stories, let's say like all set in parties. And I, I kept returning to that setting and like, I was bored of it. That's not to say other readers were, but I just wanted to, challenge myself to change things up and I think it's always good to challenge yourself as a writer whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction or whatever uh, like I think even if the challenge you find it unsuccessful you know even if you you sit there and write about something and you're you get to the end and think oh this this didn't work out I didn't like it I don't I don't want to do that again you learn that you know you learn something about yourself yeah. and so I, I you know in my classes Sometimes there's one or two prompts where people people say, I, I didn't really, I couldn't really do this one, or I only got a sentence or two, just didn't work for me. I mean, that's still useful data for your own, you know, arsenal to, to say, okay, well, maybe I won't try that again. Maybe I'll stick with these other things that did work. I, I think you learn as much from what works as what yeah. in writing the, and in yeah. life, but especially yeah. in writing. Uh, so, so I think there's nothing wrong with taking the time to try something. No, that's not, I mean, maybe you come into erotica saying, okay, I'm only going to write about femdom BDSM from the dom's point of view. And all the submissives are going to be younger men and all the doms are going to be older. Okay. Like that's a very specific niche and you can own that. You can play into that. And if, if you go in knowing that, good for you if you are if you're not sure which, which most of the writers I work with I feel like are not as sure so you know if you're not sure that's where I think you can go into the experimenting I'm not knocking people who already know and want to focus on a niche because that can be a very powerful way to build an audience because there's going to be readers who who either only or largely want that niche too if you choose a popular one, but, you know, and also you can have multiple pen names for different, you know, niches, or you can have one, but I'm, you know, just cause you try one thing for a certain time period doesn't mean you're stuck with it forever. Well, one of the things about your chapter three with the writing prompt, again, it's providing that permission, just like you're discussing, I can do it any way I want to, I can attack any of these topics that are of interest to me from any direction that I want to. And I think that because you lay such a great foundation of permission, when you get to the book part where you're discussing some real editing components, like I loved it when you talked about beginning writer issues, emphasize what is sexy for your characters so that your readers understand. And then you have that positioned with your page 101, five questions to ask yourself when editing your scenes. These are the kinds of things that are the nuts and bolts. And so beginning writers, you know, you're setting up a great structure for them to you know look at what they're doing and I have to tell you I I loved when you talked about bringing yourself and what you uniquely bring to the story and when you were talking about writing in real world you use consent and you actually use the phrase safer sex and from a sex educator standpoint I jumped up and down because when people say safe sex in the world, there is no such thing as safe sex. All we can do is do things that will make us safer. Safe is I'm 100% abstinent. And so for you to use that phrasing was just music to my ears in terms of, you know, thinking about this. And you and I have talked about any number of different things. And, you know, my contribution moving forward with the work that I want to do is taking a look specifically at language and so I don't even use the phrase sex scenes anymore. My phrase is scenes with sex so that I can help people move away from 
the movie script, the um, heteronormative direction, and if we're looking at how you're building your characters and what they're doing, um, the sexuality in a scene is going to address any number of things, and maybe that will be expansive and help people do that. So I'm excited about how all of this for you and for me is an evolution and it's pretty exciting. So before I open it up, I want to let you tell folks, how do you go about choosing stories for an anthology? And, and I'm talking about this process wise, and is it different for each of the different anthologies you've created? I can definitely answer that. I wanna just go back to what you just said about scenes with sex, because I, I noticed that and I was curious about it. I also think it's an important distinction because I think it can even go beyond scenes with sex to scenes with um, sexuality, because some of the things that turn us on or our characters on may not be the actual sex. Like it may be, you know, it could be someone whispering in someone's ear something really dirty in a public place. So I, those characters wouldn't necessarily think of that as quote unquote sex. They might consider it foreplay, but that might be the hottest part of it to them. Like if they spend an hour at yeah. a party where like they have to stay for work or whatever. And then meanwhile, someone's whispering super dirty things in their ear and then they can finally leave and maybe they just go in an alley and, you know, have a quick quickie, uh, but, but maybe not that the quickie isn't hot, but, but it's hot because of this hour of foreplay of the dirty talk. Or I was thinking of a story, which I haven't reread recently. Cause I don't, I don't always go back and read my, reread my own stories. Cause I don't know it's, when it's your own writing, you're, you're in that critique mode in your head. But I wrote a story for a book called Take Me There, Trans and Gender Queer Erotica, edited by Tristan Taramino. And it's called Punching Bag. And I can't remember if I mentioned it in How to Write Erotica, but it's about a trans man and he is turned on by being part of this boxing match. And I didn't know anything about boxing. I barely know anything now, but I really wanted to explore something, a, a plot where the turn on was something that we don't necessarily think of as a culture, as erotic. And you could extrapolate that to anything i mean what if someone's turn on is um you know checking their mail in the mailbox and like the anticipation of that i mean i don't know how you would flesh that out into a full-fledged story but there's all kinds of turn-ons people have that are not just about being naked with another person's body or being naked with themselves like maybe you know a good voyeur is a perfect example so maybe that voyeur is getting off on watching people have sex, whether that's at a sex party or through a window or, or on like on a cam or only fans or whatever. But if that is what brings them the most sexual excitement, you know, it is watching a scene with sex. Like, you know what I mean? Like for that character, like is the watching sexual? And I think it can be. And one of the earliest stories I wrote was called lap dance lust. And it was about a woman getting a lap dance at a strip club inspired by a lap dance I got at Cheetah's in Los Angeles. And there's not what we would probably consider sex because it's, they're not, I don't think there's even an orgasm, but why I think that story resonated and was published is because there is sexual tension. There's arousal. There's, there's, there's a mood created. So I, I think that's a very important distinction and something that sometimes authors, especially new to the genre, like rush into the sex scene. And that's not to say you can't start a story with a sex scene, but, and this does go to partly towards answering your question about what I look for. I, I always want to know why something is turning on the characters. You know, what what about the moment, whether it's, a lap dance or <laughs> boxing or watching someone or showing off or whatever it is, you know, why for those characters is this so momentous? And that's what you did in your story, Donna, uh, infused leather in best women's erotic of the year volume three, because, you know, different characters might have different fetishes, different leather fetishes. They might have different reasons for having that fetish. And that's, that's, I think why I'm still editing erotica all these years later thousands of stories later because every 
everyone is new in its own way. Um, so what, what I look for and how I approach my books is, I mean, first of all, I try to cast the widest net possible. Uh, I post my calls for submissions online. I think maybe I, I don't have it all in one exact place, but I can, there, there should be some recent tweets. Maybe they can be pins, um, with my guidelines right now. I'm editing two anthologies, a flash fiction anthology of 69 stories, I'm looking for stories, unpublished, 1,000 to 1,200 words. And beyond that, pretty wide open. I just want a lot of variety. Uh, And then the deadline for that is May 1st. And then that's open to any authors. Best Women's Erotica of the Year, Volume 10, is open to uh, women and gender nonconforming and gender queer authors. And uh, for that the theme is anything goes so also pretty open. And the reason I chose that is, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to see where authors take it. I am hoping that maybe some of the stories have a have a sort of anything goes spin to them in the sense of like a character who has not, you know, has never considered doing X or Y and then they feel this permission to do, you know, anything, maybe, maybe because they reach some sort of milestone in their life or some, some circumstances has led them to this, this idea, but what that anything goes is will be different for different characters. I mean, for some characters that might be like missionary position, sex, heterosexual sex with the lights out. And for another character that might be a, a, a gangbang orgy, or, you know, or, or like filming a porn scene, you know, I, I don't necessarily think it, it has to mean some like the, the orgy, it could mean something that is more, um, I guess, seems more mundane, but to the, to, to each of those characters, let's say there's the person attending the orgy and the people and the people in the, well, the people attending the orgy, but the people doing the missionary position sex, it could be just as momentous to all of those characters, what they're doing. So, so, you know, that's the part that I want to read about. Why is it so momentous? And if the author can bring me into the mind of those characters and, and make me feel like I'm there with them and make me feel like this is such a high stakes moment for them and it's, it's going to change their life or it's just so powerful. And that's why, they're telling the story, then that is going to make me want to read it. I know that's very vague. It's not as simple as, okay, I want, you know, five spanking stories and five bonded stories and five foot fetish stories. I don't have quotas or requirements like that. That's not how I envision my anthologies. I try to write my guidelines as broadly as possible because I would love to see maybe a mystery author submit work to me or a sci-fi author or a historical author or someone who doesn't typically write erotica, but who, you know, hears about it and thinks, Hmm, I'm going to try that. Uh, So that, that's, that's my biggest goal is just to reach more people. I, I love working with authors outside of the United States, especially ones who might have a perspective on, um, erotica and life that is different than you know the the u.s perspective which is the bulk of the authors who submit to my books are are in the u.s uh but but i'm just i really always want to be surprised especially after having done this so long i've worked with close to 800 authors i think it's something like 770 and i do have a spreadsheet and i keep track and i'm hoping that you know this flash fiction one pushes it into the 800 my goal for my kind of bucket list goal for myself as an erotica author is to publish work by a thousand authors just because I think it'd be cool to say that Uh, not to say like authors I've worked with before please feel free to submit your work Uh, I heard something interesting on a different podcast it was on mom's don't have time to read books, a recent episode with the editors of a new anthology of nonfiction called Wanting Women Write About Desire. And uh, they were saying that with these essay anthologies that they were publishing, sometimes through no fault of the authors, they will receive two essays that are essentially the same essay. 
which is how they put it. And that definitely happens to me with erotica. Sometimes not, I'm not going to say exactly the same, but sometimes I'll get two or more stories that are really strong and interesting and powerful. And I enjoyed them, but they're too similar to each other. And if I were to publish them together in one book, I would be doing a disservice to my readers because I want to give my readers as much variety as possible. So, you know, that that's something you can't predict, like you can't know what other people are writing about. But I mean, now that I just said it, maybe everyone's going to send me Brussels sprout stories. But again, like, I think if you can find a way to differentiate what you're writing from what's most likely going to land in my inbox, uh, that usually will give you a leg up. So I always tell people, bring your personal experience if you can. That doesn't necessarily mean your personal sexual experience. It could, but it could also mean maybe you, um, you know, you know someone or you are like a, I don't know, scuba diver or a, you know, for forest ranger or, or, a, or, or in a motorcycle club or whatever it is that your, your thing is, you know, maybe you play online video games or you collect vinyl records or you are a nerd about this specific thing. If you can bring that into your erotica, I think you will stand out. And an example I like to give is I have a story uh, about chess in a book called G is for Games, edited by Allison Tyler. And I knew the theme was games. And I thought, well, I played tons of chess as a teenager. I was in dozens of chess tournaments. I know that setting really, really well. Uh, I've never thought about writing a chess erotica story, but I'm, I could try it. And so I wrote about two characters who were sitting across from each other playing chess and one is lusting after the other and they're kind of silently flirting. Um, and so I, I just thought it was a fun idea, especially in this constrained environment. And there is a voyeurism element because they're being watched by other people playing in the chess tournament. But it's kind of like the example I said before of the whispering dirty talk and that, yeah. you know, yeah. not no one else, I don't think, knew in that story that these characters are lusting after each other. And so, like, they're trying to subtly give each other clues. But that one really was about creating this mood of tension and eroticism. And they're multitasking because they're, you know, they're playing a chess game, but they're also trying to flirt with each other. So there's a lot happening. And I, I love a story where two things are going on at once. I, I, I yeah. wrote one once where um for the and for the men edited by rose caraway where a man is giving a speech to his company but he's also giving these double entendres to his lover who's in the audience so he's trying to find words that work both ways you know and she understands because they have these private jokes and i thought that was it was a fun challenge to try to find things that he could say that were, you know, secretly dirty, you know, where not everyone in the whole company would know. Cause you know, I think that would, that's too far as this mention of disbelief. If, he, if he's like up there supposed to be talking about corporate strategy and he's like, and actually I really want to, you know, fuck this spreadsheet. I mean, I, I, you know, like you can go for humor if that's what you're going for. I don't tend to write humor myself. Sometimes I do. And it's sometimes it's, unintentional but humor is not my strong suit I'm generally much more serious but I love a good humor story there's a great story by Logan Zachary in the big book of orgasms the, the first one called remote control and it's a I, I think this story works really well on multiple levels and in in 1200 words or less it's about a man and woman who are a couple and they have this magic remote control where they can change like they can change their environment. They can, you know, change the color of, I don't know if this is actually what happens in the story, but, you know, let's say the color of the walls, they can change their hair color. They can change their genitals. They can change aspects of their physical bodies. And so I thought it was just so powerful because it's hilarious the way it's written, but then it really makes you think about like, if I could change X or Y about a partner or a character, what would I, and how would they react? And, and there's just so much gender swapping and, and just characteristic swapping that goes on in that story. And it's, it's done in such a playful, fun way, but I think it is making a broader point. So that one really, yeah. um, so, I love that one. 
Well, and I love that one too. That was one of my favorites that I read in that book. And what I want to do real quick is just kind of reset the room. Um, first of all, Misha, you have done a beyond outstanding job. You can purchase this lovely book in one of these tweets over your head. Um, she has also listed your um, submission calls up in the tweets. Yep. So, that, so that's there. And um we are talking with Rachel Kramer Bussell about her How to Write Erotica book release yesterday. And Misha had her hand up. I'm going to let her ask a question. And any other folks that want to come up and ask questions, now's the time to request the mic. Go ahead, Misha. Actually, I just wanted to say thank you because when I wrote Chased by the Wolf for Big Book of Submission Volume 2, I was like, this story has no sex in it. It's not going to be accepted. And then it was accepted. <laughs> And then I was like, nobody's going to like this story because it doesn't have any sex in it. And then I read reviews. And one of the reviews that sticks with me today is this story has absolutely no sex in it, but it is one of the hottest stories I've ever read. So don't be afraid to submit a good story that has no scene with sex. I love that. Because it might be somebody's favorite. I love that. And that's the thing. I, I don't think you can... I don't think you should base your writing on what other people think, unless it's, you know, your agent or editor or whatever. But uh, I do think that, like I said earlier, there's an audience for everything and people may not know going in, I want to read erotica with no sex in it, or I want to read erotica about someone with mental health issues, which I've published several stories about aspects of mental health. Um, one was an agoraphobia story that is one of the most powerful I've ever read. I feel really badly because I know it's in a best women's erotic of the year and I don't have it in front of me. I don't have the story title right at the tip of my tongue, but um, those stand out to me. And like Misha, I think that's such a powerful example and it can be very gratifying to know that something that you came up with that you even or maybe especially if you weren't sure about it, that someone saw something in it that, that, you know, moved them. And I, I think especially because erotica is fiction with sexuality in it, it's very powerful. People remember the scenes. They might not remember every detail, but I once wrote a story for an article for Playboy about why men read erotica. And I interviewed a lot of men about, you know, what they get out of erotica and, that they would recount to me stories they had read a long time ago and that was very vivid in their mind. I think the, one of the biggest differences, I'm not pitting a written erotica against, you know, pornography movies, but I think the scenarios of erotica, if it's something that really turned you on or the writing really moved you, you'll remember for a long time. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And again, I'm going to say this is a time for people to request the mic. I, you know, Rachel, you're talking about your prompts. I absolutely love when you put a submission out because it gets my, my fire going. What would Rachel get from me that would be different from everybody else? And let me tell you, I had the best time doing Charlotte the Pirate Queen. And Misha has heard this story forever because I have the uh, Amelia Island Museum around the corner from my house. So when I walk every day, I'm there. And your submission is sitting in my head. Sexy strangers, what might they do? And every time I'd walk by the building, I would get another piece of information. Someone is sitting here doing genealogy work. Someone is sitting here doing this. And I would just stand in front of the museum going, give me more information here. And boom, Charlotte was born. <laughs> I love that. And I, I think it's going to be different for everyone. But I really want to encourage people, you know, maybe you you know, maybe you're a new mom and you're like at home all the time with your baby, like that doesn't, and or whatever your situation, maybe you cannot leave your house or you're, you're, you're working, you know, 60 hours a week, whatever your situation, you don't have to go out and be doing research for your erotica or you can do research at your computer. But I really want people to understand that they can use whatever the surroundings they have access to, to get inspired and, and certainly, like, if you are traveling or if you're doing something out of the ordinary, that can often be a rich source of erotic yeah. ideas. But, but it can be your everyday life. It can literally be, like, you know, meeting your neighbor at the bus stop or going to the 
drugstore or, you know, I mean, the drugstore now uh, has lots of vibrators and lube and, you know, other sex toys. That section is ripe for, I don't know, a meat cute or, you know, people fighting over the last cock ring or whatever it is. <laughs> I love it. Well, look, I have people that said they want to ask you okay. questions. Ramon, um, you go first. And then Rachel of Bad Redhead Media, you go second. So go ahead, Ramon. Hey there. And hello, uh, Rachel. Um, just briefly, I started um, writing uh, erotica in 2020 uh, because the lockdown and the blessing that gave me of sitting back and saying, are there things that I've wanted to do or try in my life that I've never done before? And kind of like you, uh, I am not of, I, I'm not a writer. Um, you know, I don't have that background in me, but uh, I do want to say two things to you. Number one, um, you know, you were one of the people I quickly recognized as a good person to study as I wanted to get into this. Cause I'm a nerd, I'm an analytical person. And uh, so I want to say that the book you put out now from what I understand about it is so consistent in many ways to all the guidance you've provided over, over well over a decade now. And those are other things I've read and studied. So um, it's nice to see your evolution in this new book versus everything you've done in the past and it's such a consistent, but updated evolution. So thank you so much for, uh, for doing that. Um, the other thing, is when I took on this challenge, I said, well, I want to write in at least three genres. Uh, and it's at least two of them wanted to be things that I'm not intimately familiar with. But uh, I wanted to take on the challenge of creative writing. And the other thing I studied was a number of the uh, anthologies that um, you've put out primarily through uh, uh, the ones that Caraway has uh, done audiobooks for because I'm an auditory type learner. Uh, it's it's a struggle for me to read a book. I'll just say it that way. But to be able to hear it, uh, it, it works for me. So, And the fact that you put out such a broad ranging scope of stories really, really helped convince me that it's more the presentation and content and how you evolve the story in the mind and, and take that element, even if it's Brussels sprouts, uh, versus anything else. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. And I, and that's very true. I, and I mean, especially there was a book that came out, I don't know when a long time, like maybe 15 years ago, maybe more by Betsy Lerner called think like an editor. I honestly don't remember all the details, but I'm sure it was good because I had it on my bookshelf for a long time. And then I, I moved and I had to call some of my books, but I think that's just that title, like thinking like an editor, um, which is not to say like you should just try to cater to whatever you think I want, but like people have to understand that as an editor, I'm receiving could be 100, 200, 300 stories, and I can pick, you know, 69 for the flash fiction, maybe 25 for the other books, depending on the word count. So, you know, just in general, I'm having to call at least half, usually like three quarters of the stories that I receive. So that is why I really emphasize to people, uh, like even if I received a hundred amazing stories and I could only pick 25, I would still have to use some metric to decide. And two things about that. One is that I'm, a, I'm one person, you know, I'm the one making the decisions. My publisher has the final say, but I am basically the one making the decisions. So, you know, what I pick might, or definitely would not be the exact same thing someone else would pick. Um, so keep that in mind, especially because, you know, rejection is just part of being a writer. I get rejections all the time for my fiction and nonfiction. But second of all, yeah, like if you can find a way without compromising your values or your interests to write something that will likely stand out for me as an editor, that's going to help you. But at the same time, if, you have your heart set on writing something and, you know, I reject it or some other editor rejects it. Like, don't, I mean, don't give up. There, there's so many other things and places you can publish your work. I highly recommend getting an account on medium.com if you want to get real time feedback from readers because you can tag your stories there. So 
you know, let's say mm. you wrote spanking erotica, you could tag it spanking, you could tag it BDSM, you could tag it erotic fiction. And I, I think there's a discoverability factor, like people searching for those things may find you there more easily than if you just put it on uh, your own website, you know, that, that people would have to know about to get to. So I, I don't think anything you write erotica or otherwise is ever wasted. And I think we can all learn from the things we write. Uh, you know, that's not to say you shouldn't, you know, keep revising your work, but I, I think it's, I think it's a good exercise if you want to be published to try to submit your writing and, you know, see what happens. But also there's other avenues, especially now, like in 2023 versus in 1999, when I was editing, uh, when I was writing my first stories, there were, there were different outlets, but there wasn't the flourishing options. I know, Donna, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but you, you edit Erotica 2, right, for Rosie? Yeah. And then, uh -huh. you know, there's there's apps, there's serialized apps, there's places like Medium and Lit Erotica. I mean, there, there's just many options. And you don't have to only pick one of those. Like, you can you know, be with a traditional publisher and self-publish and put some things on Medium and put some things here. I mean, you have many ways of approaching it. So depending again on what your goals are, if your goals are to have people read your stories, like Misha was talking about and get feedback, you know, like an anthology is a great way because you're gonna have multiple people um, bringing their audiences to it. So, you know, that expands it beyond your specific audience. If you want more immediate feedback, because for my books, there's usually about a year, sometimes more lag time between when you're submitting the work and when, if it's accepted, it would be published. So if you want immediate feedback, you can use something like Medium or Twitter or social media spaces. Uh, some, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on every social media space and the rules about them change so often. So some social media outlets uh, have more leeway around erotic content than others, you know, and you could also, you know, maybe if you have a photographer friend or an artist friend, you could think about doing a, a combination visual art and written word and, you know, creating something new that's, uh, you know, giving readers something like artwork to look at along with your writing. I mean, there's just so many possibilities. Uh, I've, I've sort of lost track of what I, what I was trying to say, but uh, Ramon, thank you for I, that. I think, Rachel, too, you're addressing the um, eggs in many reading baskets and, you know, how can we best get our content out there and where can people write and that mm -hmm. sort of thing um, to, to get their information going and whatever and i see that we're getting close to time and rachel um is up on the <laughs> stage whoops yeah. where did she go Do donna can i just add one quick thing yeah go um, ahead you're right there's a lot of writing sources uh rachel even guided me to one of my best ones in Irwa. but um i would love to see more people willing to do artwork for writers um if if there could be a network building up of people that are willing to do the artwork, the illustration, whatever that a writer wants. Um, that's that's been tough to find. So anyway, I'm gonna let the mic go because there's maybe maybe Donna can like have an erotic artist on on Twitter Spaces. I don't know yeah. someone off the top of my head, but I I would imagine there's I know there's a lot of erotic artists on Twitter. So maybe yeah. someone would want to partner with with a writer. I, you know, I don't know exactly how you would monetize that, but I think especially for people who who are more visually inclined. I mean, I'm personally such a reader. Yes, I like art and I, you know, I watch movies, I go to museums, but when I'm reading, I'm such a word person, but I know there's people who would welcome kind of a mix of imagery, whether it's, yeah. you know, photography, or artwork. I, I think that's a great idea. And then, you know, online spaces are such a easy way. It would be an easy way to transmit that. Like, to because, you know, people, well, people a, may see the title, but, if the image gets their attention first, that seems to be f more, far more powerful. That's that's why I bring it yeah. up. Thanks. Yeah. And that's a great idea to think about um, erotic artists and doing a, a space so we can talk about it. I know there's um, a person named Annabelle Brito, and this may be the coolest thing that ever happened to me, but she read uh, one of my stories and created art 
for my story based on the story and sent it to me. Mm. And I was blown away. And she did that a second time. And my partner actually had those particular pictures put on metal. They're hanging here in my office. Wow. And it's like, yeah, the the part of somebody else interpreting what it is that you wrote and adding that to the process. And again, I think some of the issues that you're going to have are, is the art going to be usable in specific places? You know, what are the rules and regulations and that sort of thing? So that's always an important, you know, direction <laughs> to consider. You're always walking the fine line between all of that. So, Rachel, in our last five minutes, was there a question that I didn't ask you that you expected me to? Uh, no, because I just, it's been a kind of whirlwind week. Like, you know, I, I think it's funny how time sort of morphs when, you know, you, you've worked on a book for the, you know, I worked on this book the first half of 2022, and then it was, you know, being copied edited, and printed. And then all of a sudden, the last few weeks, it was like, oh, it's coming out. There's lots to do. So I, I feel like I haven't really had a chance to kind of sit back and think about that yet. But um, I, I, this isn't a question. I just really do want to emphasize that if you want to write erotica, you know, nothing is stopping you. Like, don't let, you know, rejections or imposter syndrome or nervousness or whatever stop you. Don't let the fact, you know, maybe you literally cannot tell anyone in your life they're judgmental or their other issues. You can write in under a pseudonym. You can password protect your computer. You can find ways to, you know, access that creative side of you that are personal and private, uh, you know, and not everyone wants to write for publication. Uh, I, a lot of people, I think, come to erotica for uh, sexual gratification. Yes, sexual gratification, but that's not what I meant. I meant more like sexual healing, sexual exploration, personal work of figuring out their own impulses and desires. That's also a very common and valid reason to pursue erotica. Um, and, you know, that, that path might look different than someone looking to publish. And also I've heard from writers of other kinds of fiction that the book was helpful to them. You know, you, you can write erotic scenes in other kinds of fiction or, or other kinds of nonfiction, you know, if you're writing like an erotic memoir or something along those lines, I, I don't think the book is, it's about erotica, but that can transcend the erotica genre. Well, I'd also uh, like to uh, include a last thought. Um, reading erotica is a great way to experience things in a safer way that you would not normally go to. Um, writing it helps you live the fantasy on paper. I love how you put that. Um, I did want to say, I hope it's okay if I like plug plug the, away plug the away. book is available in print and ebook and there will be an audiobook i just don't know when probably in a couple months but it might be longer than that okay. uh i am teaching three upcoming erotica writing classes uh it's uh, the information you can get it on my website rachelkimmerbustle.com if you go to the calendar section actually rachel uh, it's over your head misha has oh, put okay. all of that information and, in tweets to get to all of the places for the awesome. writing class and for the link for the book and everything I'm also teaching a brand new class an essay writing class that the first one i'm doing is this sunday february 19th and then another one february 22nd uh, so if anyone is interested in writing nonfiction, the setup is a little bit similar to my erotic classes. There will be some prompts, but there will also be some suggested reading and you get access to a, a list of uh, an ongoing Google sheet of market markets for essays. So if anyone's interested in that, that's also on my website under calendar. Uh, and that that's a brand new class. So anyone who takes it this month, you're a little bit guinea pigs, but um, I'm really excited because my other in my other writing life, I write a lot of nonfiction. And, uh, you know, I, you not that's not everyone's cup of tea. Some people want to live in purely fictional world That's you're totally welcome to. I'm not saying anyone should write essays or nonfiction, but if you want to, that's also something I offer. 
Well, Rachel, I am just tickled the day that, you know, your work crossed my computer and it happened in a uh, writing um, group who said, you need to go to this location. And that's how I found um, Between the Sheets and the rest is history. You know, we've done so many different things together. It's been really exciting. You inspire me to continue. And I'm just happy to be here today to celebrate you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to have this book out. And I'm so happy to be in this community that you've created. And now you really have made me uh, want to come back to Savannah. I don't know if I will do another in-person class because I actually really like teaching online because I think I think people have a lot more freedom when you're at home. You can, you know, you can, I, I think there's... There's pros and cons of both, but um, I, I'm enjoying teaching online. So, you know, if you can't make those classes, but you want to come to one in the future, like stay tuned. I'm th thinking of doing a class on how to edit an anthology. I just have to get like my thoughts together because there's so many steps and I'm afraid that I'll teach it and then forget like five essential <laughs> things that I wanted to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm making notes, but I, I'm hoping to teach that maybe in May or June. I love it. I love it. Well, we have come to the end, and I thank you so much for being here. And Ramon, I thank you for coming up and, and speaking and asking a question. And Misha, as always, my lovely co-host in this process, taking care of business. All of the things that Rachel talked about, Misha has also put those um, in tweet form that'll be on my Twitter timeline within this chat. So that'll be great too. Uh, please follow Rachel and follow everything that she's doing. Um, also above your head, you can subscribe to my newsletter and my YouTube channel. And I just wanted to say, I've been reporting that on Thursdays, the new podcast that I do, Purple Sex and Erotic Whims, will not be happening on the Moan app because I will be at the airport picking up Misha Elliott for the book festival that we're doing this weekend down on the island. So you could come back next week and we will be talking with Anne Solega about sexual empowerment. So I'm really looking forward to that. And you can meet her and hear the things that she's working on. So everyone have a great day today. Enjoy yourself. And remember, keep pleasure happening in your life. Bye. Thank you. Bye.